heard of the Ten Commandments, the list of thou shalt nots found in the Bible. Jesus saw in these commandments not onerous burdens, but guardrails and guideposts designed to help us experience the good and beautiful life. Words that set safe boundaries, create order out of chaos, help communities live peacefully and protect us, often from ourselves. Every thou shalt not was intended to point to a life-giving thou shalt. These ancient words were given by a loving God who longed to protect us from harm while pointing toward the keys to a deeply meaningful and joyful life. Join us as we read the Ten Commandments through the eyes of Jesus. So today we're continuing this series, Words of Life, and as I think about that today, uh, I think about gardening and the tough work of gardening. I don't know if any of you are a gardener, if you've ever, you know, planted some plants or you planted some shrubs. Uh, maybe, I, you know, I think a lot of people when we, we do gardening or, or, or landscaping, we want low maintenance, right? That, that's kind of what we all strive for, something that you don't have to do a whole lot with. But maybe you've planted something and then you've just ignored it. And if you just ignore a garden, if you just ignore your landscaping, you know what happens is if you wait long enough, you'll come back and you'll find your lovely garden just completely overrun with weeds. <laughs> lots and lots of weeds. Uh, they will be everywhere throughout your garden. And if you ignore, it, ignore those weeds long enough, you'll find that it's impossible to recover your garden. You just need to take everything out and start all over again. The weeds have completely choked out all the good plants that you have. Now, a healthy, thriving garden, it's going to require that you do some maintenance. I, you know, I think we can even see that here around Woldemar, where we are. Like, it's a lot of work to maintain this nature center. That, like, nature is constantly growing, and weeds are cropping up in different areas. And while well, I have to admit, I'm a little obsessed with this. Um, so if you go to my yard, you have to hunt hard to find weeds, because I love to stay on top of those weeds. I've never had a garden grow over, get overgrown on my watch. It doesn't happen. But this idea, I think, of gardening, it, it's really a great metaphor, not just for what we do in the soil, but, but for our souls. And, and this resonates with me personally, because it's a metaphor, I think, for what's going on in my head and what's going on in my life. And Sometimes there's so many things going on in my life. There's so many plates that I have spinning up in the air that I don't have the time to do the work to tend to the garden of my soul. I don't tend to my soul, and I don't pull weeds. I don't care for the plants that are my soul. Now, in preparing this message, I looked at my schedule, and my schedule has opened up a little bit over the summer. Um, I don't have youth group on Sunday nights. Usually, I would have teen fuel on Sunday nights, but quite often, in order to make vacations work, like my family and I, we just got back on Saturday from a vacation, I'll have something church-related on Monday night, on Tuesday night, on Wednesday night, on Thursday night, and... I'll be honest, when I'm that busy, I really don't have a lot of time to just sit with my wife, Jana. I don't have a whole lot of time to just be with my family. It's go, go, go from one thing to the next, one meeting to the next, one task to the next, getting stuff done, getting stuff done, getting stuff done from morning to evening. Now, do you think my family likes it when I'm that busy? No. My kids are shaking their heads. No, they don't. Jana is very clear on this. No, she doesn't like it either. Do you think that the garden of my soul is well cared for when I'm that busy? No, it's absolutely not. Now, pastors aren't the only people who struggle with this, who struggle with busyness and who have a lot going on. The Gallup Group, they did a survey of 7,500 full-time employees in 2018, and they asked these employees if they ever wrestled with burnout. And they found that 23%, 23% of full-time employees felt burned out very often or always. Very often or always. Another 44% were burned out some of the time. That's a whopping 67% of full-time employees who are wrestling with burnout. And that's just at work, and that's before the pandemic. <laughs> that was 2018. That was four years ago. I imagine if we repeated this right now, it would be even higher, even higher. People are wrestling with being tired. This is us. This is our children. This is our grandchildren. 
Uh, this is a pandemic that it's affecting all of our country. We are burned out. We're tired. We're busy. We're overwhelmed. Now, why are people wrestling with this, with being burned out? Well, there's so much work to be done, unmanageable workloads. There's constant conflict. There's fear. There's anger present in our country. There's unreasonable time pressure. Got to get stuff done. Got to get it done now. Got to get it done now. There's an ongoing strain of, of the pandemic and of navigating health and health issues. People are simply tired physically and emotionally. We're spent. I came across an article in the New York Times by Brene Brown. She's a researcher. She's a podcaster. She's a New York Times best-selling author. She wrote about burnout saying, here's a quote I once heard from a priest. If you don't want to burn out, stop living like you're on fire. Stop living like you're on fire. Brene Brown says about this, she says, when burnout creeps up on me, I don't like the person that I become. When burnout creeps up on me, I don't like the person I become. When we are burned out, when we're emotionally spent, when we're exhausted, when we feel like we don't have enough hours in the day to get everything done, or when it seems like we just can't get it all done, there's too much to do, everything suffers in our lives. Our physical health suffers. Our relationships suffer. We are, as Brene Brown says, no longer the person we want to be. This is true in our marriages. This is true in our parenting. This is true in our work with other people. This is true in our schoolwork, kids. This is true in our relationship with God. We need to stop living like we are on fire. And that brings us to our first question for discussion this morning. It's, it's where have you seen the cost of being too busy, either in your own life or in the lives of those around you. I'm going to give you 90 seconds to turn to someone near you and to discuss this cost of being busy. If you're online, you can put your comments in the chat section. Let's take 90 seconds and discuss this question. There's a price that's paid by everyone around us when we're overcommitted. There's a price that we pay for this. For the, there's a cost to busyness, which brings us today to the fourth commandment in the Ten Commandments. We're in this series, Words of Life. It's based on a series by Adam Hamilton of Church of the Resurrection in Leewood, Kansas. And this fourth response, this fourth commandment is God's response to living like we're on fire. This fourth commandment is God's response to being too busy and overscheduled and overworked now, we're going to talk today about the fourth commandment, and I invite you, in your program, you had a bookmark. I invite you to take out that bookmark so that you can look with me at the fourth commandment. Our challenge throughout this series is for you to memorize the Ten Commandments. So we want you to take this home. We want you to put it in your car, on your refrigerator, on your bathroom mirror, wherever it might be. Regularly go over these Ten Commandments. And in order to help you memorize the fourth commandment today, we're going to repeat this several times. So I'm going to say the fourth commandment, and I want you to repeat it back to me. So I'm going to say the commandment, you repeat it back to me. Remember the Sabbath day and treat it as holy. Remember the Sabbath day and treat it as holy. That's our commandment for today. We're going to go over that several times. Now, let me remind you of the context for the Ten Commandments. The people of Israel were slaves in Egypt, as I mentioned to the kids. Probably in the 13th century before Christ, this is about the time that Ramses II was Pharaoh of Egypt, and he was doing these massive building projects, as had the other pharaohs before him. And in order to build those massive building projects, now, these weren't the pyramids, these are, these are separate building projects, uh, he needed bricks. And these bricks were made of mud and of straw. Now, in order to build the buildings, the slaves would work seven days a week. As again, as I mentioned to the kids, they'd work from sunup to sundown to build as many bricks as they possibly could. And well, there were no days off, obviously, and really nobody had a day off at that time. If you were, you were super wealthy, then you, you didn't really work much. But if you were a normal person at all, you just worked all the time. You worked every day, seven days a week, no matter what your job was. And the Israelites were being driven in their work by slave masters. And when the Pharaoh came up, he, he had this new idea for them. And he said, you know, usually we would provide you with the straw and you would get the mud and then you'd make the bricks, but we're going to make you continue to make bricks, but you're going to provide your own straw for this. And we read about this story in Exodus where it says the slave masters drove the Israelites hard and, and said, make sure you have the same daily quota as when you had straw provided to you. 
And essentially, these new conditions were impossible for the Israelites. They had the feeling that they could never get everything done. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? They could never get everything done. Now this, this is the situation from which God liberated the Israelite slaves. God heard their groans. God heard their cries. And, well, God sent Moses, and they had plagues, and the the people of Israel left Egypt. God delivered them. They left Egypt, and they made their way to Mount Sinai. And it, it took them three months to make that journey from Egypt to Mount Sinai. They went from the Red Sea, traveled through the desert, got to Mount Sinai. And on the way, God did something really interesting. There wasn't enough food for everyone to eat. And so God provided manna from heaven. It's this, this sort of white crystal-like substance that, that God came, provided. It was like part of the dew in the morning. You know, like if you went outside right now, the grass is real wet. The, the grass would be wet with manna. And the people would pick it up, they'd collect it, and they would eat it. It was God's provision for God's people. Now, God then said to the Israelites, he said, on Friday, I'm going to give you twice as much manna, twice as much manna, And I want you to collect it, and I want you to prepare enough manna for Friday and for an additional day for Saturday, because I want Saturday to be your day off. I want Saturday to be a day of rest for you. Now, let me pause here in the story of the Israelites, because this is huge, and most of us don't recognize it. Many of us haven't realized the significance of this yet, because this is the first time in recorded human history, the first time it's written down, where any group of people were regularly given a day off. It had never happened before. You look in the Genesis account, it's not, not before this, not until the manna is stored so that they can have enough for the next day and to take a day off. You see, up to bo- that point, it was a really an agrarian society and you worked every single day. So we have this radical shift in human history. God said, I want you to have one day. I want you to have a day, a day where you are resting, a day where you are revering, a day where you are being restored. And this happens before the Ten Commandments. You know, we're holding the Ten Commandments in our hand in that bookmark. This is happening before the Ten Commandments are given. So eventually the people arrive at Mount Sinai and and Moses goes up on the mountain and God formalizes this fourth commandment, to have a day of rest. Now earlier we read a portion of that commandment together on our bookmark and you can look at your bookmark and sort of see it embedded in here but I want to read the whole commandment for you. It's the longest actually of the Ten Commandments. You might not know that this fourth commandment is actually the longest one and it's found in Exodus chapter 20. So I'm going to read this out loud for us. So here's the commandment. Remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. You have six days each week for your ordinary work But the seventh is the Sabbath day of rest, dedicated to the Lord your God. On that day, no one in your household may do any work. This includes you, your sons and daughters, your male and female servants, your livestock, any foreigners living among you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and everything in them. But on the seventh day he rested. This is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart as holy. Now, I want to be clear on this, what I just read. This is, this is the oldest record we have of a day off. In anywhere in the world, any culture, any society in the world up to this point, this is the first time that we know where someone recorded that human beings had a day off, a day of rest. And God says you need this. You need a day of rest, a day to be renewed. You need to be recreated on this day. And this idea is really profound and it's really life-altering and it wasn't just for Israelites. I love this. Did you notice in there that that this wasn't just for parents, but this is for their kids too. Uh, You were to let your servants have a day of rest. You were to let the immigrants in your midst, the the foreigners among you, those who, who didn't practice the same religion as you, they needed rest too. It wasn't just for you, it was for everyone. You were to let the animals have a day of rest. The pastor and the trees and the orchards were to have a day of rest. All of creation, all of creation rests on the Sabbath. Now this word Sabbath, it it literally means to cease or to rest as best as we know or understand it. It's a remarkable commandment. And, And as you can see in that commandment, it points us back to Genesis 1 and the created order of things. Now as I mentioned, this is the fourth commandment. And it comes before we get into you know, the moral commandments. So, so these are sort of like things we should do, right? And, and we're going to get next week into the, the, like, the thou shalt nots, like the, you know, the things we shouldn't do. 
But, but before we get there, we have the longest commandment of all ten commandments. And we won't, well, let's not read the whole thing again, but maybe, will you read with me again the, the, the fourth commandment? Let's read this. Remember the Sabbath day and treat it as holy. Now, I think it's important that this commandment comes before those other commandments about honoring our parents. We'll talk about that next week. About not murdering, about not stealing, not coveting. And I think it, it tells us that maybe this is a super important commandment for fulfilling the rest of the Ten Commandments. So today we're going to take a closer look at this. We're going to start with remembering the Sabbath day, and then we're going to look at treating it as holy. Now, with the Ten Commandments, again, you, you may not know about this, but there are different penalties assigned to each commandment and not keeping that commandment. Now, they aren't within the Ten Commandments themselves, but later on in the Torah, the, the sort of legal rules and everything that help us to follow God, there are found different penalties. Do, do you know what the penalty is for not following the Fourth Commandment? Does anyone know what it is? Silence. No, no Bible scholars here today. Okay. It is death. Whoa, death. If you don't follow, you don't remember the Sabbath day and treat it as holy, the penalty is death. Now, that sounds pretty harsh, doesn't it? <laughs> like, whoa, okay, like, really? But, but let, me, let me explain. Here's what I think as I listened to Adam Hamilton talk about this, as I reflected on it more myself, did some reading myself. I don't think that God wants to put anyone to death. Let's be clear on that. God does not want to put you to death. But I think God is saying, listen, listen. This is super serious. And I know you. I know what you are like. I've claimed this day, and I want to give it to you as a gift. I want to give it to you as a gift because you need it. Now, God says, I know you. I know you so well. I know you're going to go back to work. I know you're going to let other stuff impinge on this day. I know you. I know you. I know you're going to wrestle with this. You're going to wrestle with the temptation to do things and to accomplish things. I know you. So I'm going to threaten you with death. Because this is that serious. I want you to take it seriously. Now, again, as I say this, I think there's a metaphorical understanding here. And that's also that, that if you refuse to pay attention to this commandment, if you work and you strive seven days a week, there's a death that you will experience in your life. You're going to kill yourself. And maybe not literally, but you're going to kill your relationships you're going to kill the joy of your life. You're, you're not going to be living life to the full that God would want for you. There's a metaphorical death that happens when we work, 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 busy, busy, busy all the time. And God is reminding us with the penalty for this. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy because this is a big deal. This is a huge deal. It's literally life or death. Now, now my Sabbath, as I've shared before, it's Friday. So I take Friday off, and, and really a, a good Friday off means maybe going for a hike, maybe doing some reading. But the temptation when I first get up on Friday is, I better quick check my email for a second. I don't know if you ever experienced this on the day off. I'm going to quick check my email. So, I, you know, if I do this, I'll go and check my email. And, and then once I check my email, I'm like, well, you know, I better check my texts too. And so I, you know, look through my texts. And then, well, you know, I, I need to check Messenger as well and, and make sure no one's trying to get a hold of me there. And if I'm doing that, very easily, suddenly hours have elapsed. And I've totally gotten engrossed in work. And guess what happens then? It, it alters the rest of my day. I, I might not get to the hike that I wanted to do. I might not get to reading the book that I wanted to read. And it's all too easy for me to get to the end of Friday and still feel exhausted, to still feel tired because I got caught up in work. And I'm guessing many of you feel the same way. Many of you feel the same way every day. And I'm also guessing that, that for many of us, we don't actually practice a true Sabbath. And I'm convicted by how many of us as followers of Jesus Christ have a really weak Sabbath observance. Well, let's just be honest with this. Most American Christians, we suck at Sabbathing. We're terrible at it. We do not do this well. We allow so many things to creep in. It, it, it's our phones. It's our laptops. 
It's, well, we all went remote, right, for work with the pandemic. And remote is a great option, but guess what it allows to do? It allows work to creep into every area of our lives. It's the work we didn't get done on Saturday. So then, well, you know, you need to do some stuff to get ready for Monday and, and work has crept in. It's the traveling. It's, it's the going all over for activities and for sports. And, and let me tell you, I wrestle with all this too. It's really hard to keep a Sabbath. Which leads us to our next question for discussion. And the question is this, do you have a Sabbath? It's kind of a simple yes or no question, but then what does or what could it look like to have a Sabbath? I'm going to give you 90 seconds again to turn to someone near you to answer this question. You can answer it online. Put your comments in the comments section. Let's take 90 seconds and think about this question. This is hard stuff. It's really hard to have a Sabbath and to keep it well. So again, here's our commandment. Will you say it with me? Remember the Sabbath day and treat it as holy. Remember the Sabbath and treat it as holy. I want to focus on the treat it as holy because the holy part is important. The Sabbath is God's day. It's God's day. God says, this day is mine. I'm claiming it, and I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do with this day. On this day, I want to give it to you as a gift so that you would rest. So you would rest, and that you would renew, and that you would connect with me. And well, the Christian Sabbath is, is Sunday, but, but really, technically, it's, it's Saturday at sundown till Sunday at sundown. And I think it's really helpful if we think about Sabbath that way, as a sundown to a sundown. We, we have a ramp that helps us to get into the Sabbath, that's Saturday night. And then we have a ramp that helps us get out of the Sabbath on Sunday night. So Saturday night, Sunday night. And as followers of Jesus, we shifted the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday because, well, Jesus was raised from the dead. We celebrate the resurrection on Sunday. So every time we gather on Sunday to worship, it's like a mini resurrection celebration. It's a mini Easter celebration where we get together and we worship God and we celebrate the triumph that Christ has over sin, over evil, over injustice. God wins in the end and we celebrate that when we gather to worship. There's always hope that we celebrate today on a Sunday together as we worship. We, we are renewed. We're reminded of who we are. We're reminded of who God is as we gather to worship. Now, the Sabbath day is about being renewed so that the rest of the week, the rest of the week you can go and work. So you can go and do the good that God wants you to do. Now if you're exhausted, you can't do that. You can't do the good that God wants you to do. We need this. We need renewal. And, and the Sabbath is not, a, it's not just a vacation. And the Sabbath is not pers- permanent. Like if, if every day is a Sabbath for you, you're getting it wrong. You're called to do work. God, work is good. But we get back to work for a season. And then we take time off. And then we work. And then we take time off. This is the rhythm that God has established for us. And a, a Sabbath is a day to the Lord. Now we're gathered this morning to revere and to connect with God. We hopefully are doing that through scripture and through speaking and through singing and and through children's messages and a little later through communion. We gather to focus and to revere God. We, We remember who God is, what God calls us to be, what God calls us to do. And we're inviting the Holy Spirit today to refresh us, to renew us, for the week that we face ahead of us. And then we're going to go this upcoming week. We're going to leave out here, out of Waldemar, and we're going to go back to our lives to live for God throughout this upcoming week. And, and this struggle with doing all of this, this is nothing new. The ancient Israelites struggled with this as well. And we still struggle with this today, with keeping a Sabbath. Listen to this passage from the prophet Isaiah. This is Isaiah speaking to the Israelites, but, but I think this is Isaiah speaking to us as well today. Keep the Sabbath day holy. Don't pursue your own interests on that day, but enjoy the Sabbath and speak of it with delight as the Lord's holy day. Honor the Sabbath and everything you do on that day and don't follow your own desires or talk idly. Then the Lord will be your delight. I will give you great honor and satisfy you with the inheritance I promised to your ancestor Jacob. I, the Lord, have spoken. As I said, I think Isaiah could still be writing writing that to us today. Uh, There are blessings from God when we remember the Sabbath day and when we treat it as holy. 
Now, one of the things I found in my research that's really interesting is that Jewish, really observant Jews, they don't ask God for anything on the Sabbath. Let me repeat that. They don't ask God for anything on the Sabbath. They gather, they pray, they bless God's name, they praise God, they thank God, but they don't ask God for anything. I found that really fascinating. That's fascinating, isn't it? Every other day of the week, they ask God for things, but not on the Sabbath because the Jewish people want to give God a Sabbath as well, just as God has given them a Sabbath. The only request that they make of God for the Sabbath is for peace, for peace, for shalom, for wholeness. Now, hold on to that thought a second. I think that that this idea of what observance Jews do, it gives us an idea of how Jesus approached the Sabbath. At the time of Jesus, the rabbis had been trying to figure out how to define all the rules around the Sabbath. And, well, this is the challenge, right, when we say don't work on the Sabbath. But what are the rules? You know, tell me, what is work? What, What is not work? And the rabbis would have great debates about this. What can you do? What can't you do on the Sabbath? And around the time of Jesus, the rabbis had 39, 39 different categories of what constituted work. And then they broke it down into subcategories underneath those 39 categories. Work you couldn't or couldn't do on the Sabbath. And and through this process, they had hundreds of additional rules that fell under this fourth commandment of honoring the Sabbath and treating it as holy. Again, our commandment, let's say it together. Remember the Sabbath day and treat it as holy. Now, maybe as I'm talking about this, this brings to mind the Pharisees for you, right? Our favorite bad guys in the New Testament. I want to let you know there are still Pharisees today. (laughs) That's not just a New Testament thing. It's not just an Old Testament thing. There are Pharisees present in Christianity. There are Pharisees in every religion. We all wrestle with this. We all wrestle with the rules and what the rules are and what we need to do. Well, let me give you some examples that are kind of fun, I think, of the Orthodox Jewish people and what they consider to be work on the Sabbath. And remember, this is all of us, right? Like, we all have a Pharisee in us. Here's one of the things that you can't do. You can't add fresh water to a vase of cut flowers (laughs) because that's like sowing in the fields by keeping the flowers from spoiling. That's work. You can't separate good fruit from bad fruit because that's harvesting. Don't do it. You can't cut your fingernails or cut your hair on the Sabbath because that's like shearing sheep and that's work. Don't do it. You can't braid your hair. You can't braid your hair because that's like weaving. That's work. Don't do it. You can't turn off an electric light Don't turn off the lights on the Sabbath because that's like extinguishing a fire and that's work. Don't do it. Now, you can see this can quickly get silly, right? This can even really take this too far. Rules can be guidelines or guardrails that sort of help us keep the Sabbath day holy, but rules can quickly become silly if we're not careful. And when you have thousands of these rules, well, suddenly the Sabbath isn't about a delight. It's not about a joy. It's not about refreshing. It's not about renewing. It's all about keeping the rules. And that's not a Jewish problem. That's an us problem. That's something that we all wrestle with. The silliness of the rules around the Sabbath and what it means to delight in the Sabbath. When we study the Ten Commandments, we've been looking throughout this series through the lens of Jesus. How would Jesus read these commandments? And what we find with Jesus is that, well, Jesus didn't follow the rules the way the guys around him had set them up. Uh, Going back to that idea of not asking God for anything on the Sabbath, uh, you know, so God would have a day of rest, Jesus didn't follow that. He didn't follow it. When Jesus was in the synagogue with the people, he's on the Sabbath, People would see him and they would recognize Jesus as one who heals. And people would come to Jesus. They would ask Jesus on the Sabbath, will you heal me? And Jesus would heal them. He'd make them whole. He'd make them well. And the rabbis got really upset about this. You can't do that, they would say. You can't ask a person or you can't even ask God for anything on the Sabbath. What are you doing? This is work. You can't work on the Sabbath. But Jesus kept right on healing. He kept on making people whole even on the Sabbath. 
He kept on helping other people, even on the Sabbath. You see, Jesus didn't keep the rules the way the religious leaders of his time kept them. Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made for us. It it is meant to be a day to do good, a day to be enjoyed, a day to delight in. And if there is someone who needs something on this day, help them, assist them, help make them whole. This isn't about work. This is about being human. It's about being fully alive on this day that God has given us. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus and his disciples, they're walking through a field. And they're walking through these fields of grain and they're talking and and they get hungry. And so they they break off the heads of grain and they they put them in their mouth and they eat them. And, oh my goodness, the rabbis see this. And they're like, you're doing it again. You're working on the Sabbath. (laughs) You know, uh, you can almost imagine someone tattling like, I caught you. I can't believe you're doing this. You're working on the Sabbath. And Jesus looks at them again and he shakes his head. And he's like, come on, guys. And he responds with these famous words, the Sabbath was made to meet the needs of the people and not people to meet the requirements of the Sabbath. God did not create us to follow the rules of the Sabbath. Let me be clear. God did not create us to follow the rules of the Sabbath. God made this day for us. God made this Sabbath day and set it apart so that we might rest and be restored in delight in God. Now, now Jesus doesn't say that the Sabbath isn't important. It's important. He doesn't say, just do whatever you feel like doing on the Sabbath. He doesn't say that. But he reminds us what it is for. The Sabbath is for renewing and for resting and for revering God. Now, I'll be honest, this fourth commandment, I think this is the hardest one to keep. Now, some of the other commandments, at least on the surface, well, they can appear pretty easy to keep. I don't, I don't know about you, but I don't usually kill people. You know, not usually, only occasionally. Um, I think I'm pretty good at not stealing. Like, you know, I, I think I got that one down. But, but this one, this commandment, this is a struggle for me. As a a type A, driven, love to get stuff done sort of person, I tend to overcommit myself. And my guess is that as someone who is driven and busy and overcommitted, that that there are a lot of you who are like, yep, I can relate to that. I can relate to that. We struggle to keep this commandment. Ask any young parent how easy it is to keep this commandment. It feels nearly impossible to keep this commandment. And the problem with this difficulty, as I said earlier, is that after a while, everything will get messed up as we go and go and go. The garden of our soul will be choked with weeds. And the reason I struggle with this, and I suspect that that many of you struggle with this as well, too, is it can be really hard to say no. No. It can be hard to say no to work. It can be hard to say no to activities. It can be hard to say no to athletic events. It can be hard to say no to good things, important things. But if you're anxious, if you're tired, if you're spent, if you're emotionally exhausted, if you're moving from one thing to the next, that's a mess of your own creation. You've done that. And you're probably like me, and you've probably said yes to some things that you should say no to. And the thing is, nobody can change that but you. Nobody can change that but you. And so I want to pra- have you practice with me <laughs> saying no. <laughs> I'm going to do a call and response. <laughs> I'm going to say no, and then I want you to say no back to me. No. no. Very good. Let's do that again. No. no. Very good. It's that easy <laughs> to say No. And yet, all too often, we do not do it. If if we do not learn how to say no, we will not thrive. We will not have life to the full without having some no's in our lives. We need stillness. We need rest. We need renewal. And let me be clear, God takes joy when we say yes to the right things. God takes joy in our renewal. God takes joy in you. God takes joy in your no's as well. Now, as I begin to wrap this up today, I have one final discussion question for us. And it's, what are three things you do that renew you? And at this point, there should be pens in the blue buckets. I, I want you to talk about this question, but even more importantly, I want you to write down your answer to this question. 
so that you have a way to take it home with you today. If you're putting it in the chat, I want, I want you to put it in the chat and maybe take a screenshot so that you will remember this. What are three things that you do that renew you? How many of you give you 90 seconds to turn to someone near you and to discuss those, but also as you're doing that, to write down your answer. Three things that renew you. Three things that renew you. You've got them written down. I gave the kids homework to help the adults with this. Adults, your homework is to go home to go through this upcoming week and to do these things, to practice the Sabbath, to do these three things that renew you. Now, now for me, the three things that renew me are unhurried time with my family. They're hiking or, or walking outside, and they're reading novels. I'm going to do those things. Ask me about it. I'm going to do those things on my Sabbath. Do more of your list of three things. Now, each week throughout this series, we've, we've taken our commandment and we, we've applied it to the adoption at Asbury. And you may be wondering, how am I going to work this in? And I, I was wondering that for a while myself, too. <laughs> well, here's the last thought to bring this all together, and that is that Sabbath is best in community. <clears throat> Sabbath is best in community. We're better together. We've been worshiping throughout July to allow rest for our volunteers None of us have been on every single week. For Asbury folks, you've been able to show up throughout the month of July and just show up and worship. And I would imagine it's been a while since that has happened. We're, we haven't had any responsibilities. You can just show up and worship. And I'll tell you, it's been weird. It's been weird for me. A, a couple weeks ago, I was here with South Lansing, and I didn't have any role. I didn't have anything to do. And it was weird to just show up and worship. But it's a good weird, it's a, it's a rest, it's a renewal to not have to be on all the time. And we all need that. We need the rest and refreshment of time off. Now, the thing about time off is it, it's possible because we carry the load together. When we are work together, the load is lightened. And, and the load of life is lightened when we gather and we interact across generations and in different life places and in different seasons and throughout this month, here at Waldemar, we've lived that out. We've lived out what it looks like to rest. We've, we've lived out for a season here for Asbury folks to be able to just show up and rest as they join Sycamore Creek Church. Now, that's not a permanent thing. Remember, a Sabbath, we don't just Sabbath all the time. There's work to be done. In, in, in Asbury, as they join Sycamore Creek, we recognize there's a rest now because, well, because there's work to be done. We're looking forward to, to planting a new church, to, to starting this new thing at the Eastwood campus of Sycamore Creek. And there's going to be major work to be done. So now we rest so that we can prepare for the work that comes ahead. Remember the Sabbath day and treat it as holy. I want to invite you today to use the power of community to shape and form your Sabbath practices. Talk with each other. Hold each other accountable for keeping this commandment that we stink at keeping. Don't do it by yourself. Learn to say no to things so that you can say yes to renewal, to joy, to being restored by God. And here's the thing. Your garden of your soul, it needs it. All of us, it needs it. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you today for the Sabbath. We thank you for the joy of following you. And we pray, God, that we might receive this gift of the Sabbath. Help us to do the things that bring us joy. Help us to follow you, to work six days a week, and on the seventh, to rest. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.